Hi everybody and welcome back to Digital VSI Design. I'm Professor Adam Tiemann of the Annex Labs at bar Ilan University and we'll now go over the Kahoot discussion for Logic Synthesis Part 2. Our first question is, the result of the elaboration stage of synthesis is a list of syntax errors in your RTL, an optimized netlist of standard cells from the library, a multi-level netlist of generic gates and bited IPs, or a Boolean equation describing the RTL in the sum of products format. Well, I believe it's a multi-level netlist of generic gates and bited IPs. Let's go back to the uh, slides of the course and see how when we talked about that. So remember that this is the flow of synthesis. It starts with syntax analysis, that's kind of reading in our RTL and checking it, and then we go over to library definition before coming into elaboration binding. What is elaboration and binding? It's when we compile the RTL into a Boolean data structure, that's elaboration, but we also may have some macros, uh, either hierarchical blocks that were already synthesized, or hard macros, and we have a lib file of them. We don't have a, a Verilog module, so it, we do binding. We bind them. We find them in our target libraries and bind them to the uh, design. And then we can go and optimize the Boolean logic, which is uh, actually our pre-mapping optimization stage. So we have our RTL, we compile it, and then um, we, uh, we elaborate and bind it over here. Okay, the result is a design that is mapped to generic technology independent gates, and this is the core of the synthesis, or at least the pre mapping optimization stage. And what we have here is a multi level logic list of generic gates. So that would be our answer. Let's just go back to what we had here. A list of syntax errors in your RTL we'll get in the first part, where we you know, do our pre-syntax checking, our pre-compilation syntax checking. An optimized net list of standard cells from the library, well, that'll be afterwards when we do our technology mapping. Um, a Boolean equation describing the RTL in the sum of products format, that's not wrong. That's uh, what we call two-level logic. But actually, what we uh, get in, uh, in elaboration is a multi-level uh, netlist. So we'll be going over that in the next few questions. Question number two. Espresso is a type of, besides something that I like to drink, an algorithm for technology mapping, a multi-level logic heuristic optimizer, an algorithm for optimal Boolean reduction, or a two-level logic heuristic optimizer. And again, I think that I know the answer. To that. A two-level logic heuristic optimizer. So again, let's go back to our slides. And two-level logic, just to remind you what two-level logic is. We can take any Boolean function and show it in a sum of products or a product of sums. That's two-level logic. So you see here we have a whole uh, list of uh, one level, which is AND gates, and they are all um, output into a big OR gate. Okay? Um, so that's a, a sum of products. And we also have a product of sums where we have a whole list of OR gates that output into one AND gate. Um, so these are two-level logic, and two-level logic is the easiest way to actually go in, uh, and show a, uh, a Boolean function. It's not the most efficient way, but it for sure is the, the one that has been uh, researched a lot because, um, you know, it's very standard. We can show this, we can bring any Boolean logic function to this state and then run all kinds of different algorithms and heuristics and so forth on it. And Espresso is the most famous or popular um, heuristic optimizer that runs on two-level logic. It is not how However, as we said in the last question, the way that uh, elaboration finishes. Elaboration finishes in multi-level logic. And I didn't go much in, uh, into algorithms for multi-level logic. There are many of them. There are many different heuristics. Um, they're pretty complicated. Um, and there's a lot of good uh, data about, about it out there. You can watch Rob Rutenbar's course and learn more about it. But uh, I just showed you Espresso, which can be a basis for also some of the multi-level logic uh, um, ways of doing it. But it's uh, by uh, at its base, it's just a two-level logic optimizer. And we do a lot of these different types of things during uh, elaboration and uh, uh, optim pre-mapping optimization to try and reduce the number of literals. But Espresso works on um, two-level logic. So it is not an algorithm for technology mapping. We'll be discussing that in a minute. Um, a multi-level logic uh, optimizer, again, maybe some of the multi-level logic op uh, heuristic optimizers are based on or use some of the same concepts as, as Espresso, but Espresso in itself is only for two-level logic. It's an algorithm for optimal Boolean reduction. No, unfortunately, we don't have many algorithms for to do optimal things. Um, it's a heuristic. A heuristic gets us a, a, a good enough or tries to get a better um, solution than the one we started with, but it is sure not optimal. 
Question number three. Mark the incorrect description of a reduced order BDD, ROBDD. An ROBDD is a directed acyclic graph, DAG. An ROBDD is a canonical form of a function for an ordering. There are many ROBDDs for the function f equals a. Each node of an ROBDD represents a distinct Boolean function. And we wanted the incorrect description, and I think it's this one over here. Okay, so... This is a reduced order BDD. Um, I remind you that a BDD is a way that we can take a truth table um, and show uh, and describe a binary function or or graph out a binary function with a binary tree, uh, a, a Boolean function with a binary tree. It's a really nice way to show it. The problem with it is that each number of variables adds two to the power of that number of nodes. Um, so we get a really, really large uh, data structure in the end. Reduced order BDD is a set of operations. Uh, it's a, an algorithm that goes and removes these nets and therefore um, can arrive at a much smaller data representation and reduce the size of this thing inside uh, the machine. One of the really nice things about it is that it's canonical. In other words, that we always, after applying these rules, we will always get the same reduced order BDD in the end. That That is only when we have the same order of variables. So we took here x1, x2, x3 is the ordering of the variables. If we would have taken the same function but built the BDD with x3, x2, x1, we would have gotten a different ROBDD. Okay? Um, Another thing that's really nice is if we take any of the nodes in a BDD, and an ROBDD is the same, we'll get some sort of function. So if we start with here and just look at this tree over here, it's going to be um, not x2, x3. Or if we take uh, this one over here and look at the tree that comes out of it down here, it's going to be x2, not x3. So uh, these are kind of uh, nice things about BDDs and ROBDDs. Um, yes, an ROBDD is a directic acyclic graph. As you saw, it starts from... Uh, Basically, like any tree, it starts from some sort of root, and it, all of the, the connections are directed, and it goes downwards, it doesn't come back up. An ROBDD is a canonical form of a function for an ordering, so that's what we just said. If we take a specific ordering, x1, x2, x3, and we put our uh, rules for reduction, we'll always get the same exact ROBDD. Um, each node of an ROBDD represents a distinct Boolean function, and that's what we saw there. That uh, Each of the nodes, we can get a look at it and see what the ROBDD is, or the BDD is, uh, of some Boolean function. And the wrong answer was there are many ROBDDs for the function f equals a. And remember, over here we said that ROBDD is canonical form of a function, but only for an ordering. Well, when we only have one variable, there's only one ordering, and therefore there is only one ROBDD. And so this is uh, incorrect that there are many of them. So let's go to question four about technology mapping. Technology mapping maps RTL to technology independent logic gates. It uses tree covering to match generic logic to standard cells, it finds an optimal solution to the, uh, to the problem, or it inserts buffers and upsizes gates for stronger drive. Well, um, I think it's going to be this one. So let's go over to technology mapping. And technology mapping is the phase of logic synthesis in which gates are selected from a technology library to implement the circuit. So we read in our syntax, we elaborated, and then we ran these uh, nice Boolean um, optimizations and got to the minimum number of literals that we could. Now it's time to go and take our um, generic netlist, so we have just generic and or and so forth gates, and map them to actual standard cells from the library. Okay, so um, that is, and we shot, saw that there's a minimum cost tree covering algorithm that can um, really solve this nicely. Okay, so let's read again our answers. What does it do? It maps RTL to technology independent logic gates. No, that is what we did in elaboration. So we are now technology dependent, not independent. Okay finds an optional an optimal solution to the problem well the tree covering algorithm is an optimal algorithm but since we have different heuristics that we need to set the weights and so forth uh, it is not uh, an optimal solution in the end okay inserts buffers and upsizes gates for stronger drive that's going to be our post mapping optimization so that's not what it is and of course the definition is that it uses tree covering to map generic logic to standard cells Question number five. Mark the answer that is not a usual post-synthesis optimization heuristic. Resizing logic gates. Cloning a high fan-out logic uh, gate. 
buffering a high fan out logic gate or adding pipeline stages. Well, let's see. I think it's going to be this one. Why is that? Because as we saw before we th uh, in the lecture, we can optimize timing in many ways. And some of the ways that we do it are resizing cells so we can take a a really a weak cell and make it bigger an x1 turn it into an x3 or something like that buffer or clone to reduce load on critical nets so if we have a uh, large net with a high fan out or a high uh, uh, or a high capacitance we can go and buffer it um, put more of the or clone or make several of these copies that have the same inputs and then drive part of the net decompose large cells so we can take a large cell and make it into smaller ones let's say we have a nan4 we can make it into uh, two nan twos and a, or three nan twos swap connections on com c commutative pins or among equivalent nets so we can change which uh, net is connected to which connection in, in equivalent pins uh, move critical signals forward pa uh, pad early path and recover area so we can do all these types of things um, when we optimize timing however what we wrote here is adding pipeline stages so all three of these were um, from that list adding pipeline stages is actually a design time decision so that's something that we will cover in our RTL not uh, during post uh, mapping optimization we can retime but retiming means that we actually stick a bunch of uh, registers in and ask the tool to find out where to put them um, adding pipeline stages is not one of these typical uh, post um, post mapping optimizations question number six what is designware? Is it a synopsis synthesis tool? A methodology to write synthesizable RTL? A collection of IPs for common blocks, such as multipliers? An algorithm for optimally designing a state machine? Well, the answer over here is going to be the yellow one. So, again, where did I discuss this in the slides? When we discuss data path synthesis, so we saw that there are different complex operators like adders, multipliers, and etc. that are uh, implemented in a special way. You know, a multiplier, there are many ways to, to, to write a multiplier. We can have a uh, uh, Wallace multiplier, a Booth, uh, multi booth recoded multiplier, um, a carry save uh, array. So there are different types of structures that we can make. They are not Boolean equivalent. They do, however, produce the same result in the end. Um, therefore, when we just take the synthesizer and, and let it look at the logic, and try to make a boolean equivalent and try and optimize in the regular um, in the regular ways of uh, you know our our uh, heuristics that we have they will not actually be able to switch between these different types of implementations um, however what we can do is we can take um, designs such as a wallace tree and a booth and a, uh, and a carry save array um, that are given already uh, as IPs to our, as IPs, as soft type of IPs to our synthesizer and say, listen, try this one, see how it is, try this one, see how it is, try this one, see how it is, and then choose one of them and then continue running optimizations. Um, the way it's done is with uh, Synopsys' uh, designware IP library. Cadence has a similar thing called chipware. Um, and they're just like a long list of these different types of multipliers and adders and shifters and all kinds of other arithmetic blocks. Plus, um, in recent years, Synopsys uh, has added a whole array of IPs, of soft IPs that you can get inside their designware library. So it's not only arithmetic blocks, but it's very commonly used for arithmetic blocks. Okay, so all the other stuff was just um, not relevant. Um, what designware is, is a con collection of IPs for common blocks such as multipliers. Question number seven, mark the incorrect answer about clock gating. Clock gating is used to save power. Glitch-free gating can be implemented with just an AND gate. Synthesis tools can automatically insert clock gating. Most standard cell libraries have special clock gating cells. Well, we know it's this one. We discuss it a lot in the, in the lesson. So let's go over back to the lesson and we see that what clock gating is. There are two basic types of clock gating. So there's the block level or global clock gating where we by design know that we have these different units and we want to turn one of them off uh, according to software. So we'll go and program a register or something like that that will turn off this enable. And then for many, 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 many clock cycles, we won't be driving any, um, uh, any clock into this unit because we're not going to need it. We know by software or, some, or something else that we're not going to need it for 
long time. So we turn off the clock. We're not worried about any glitching um, through here because this is really um, not doing anything during this time. So this is global clock gating and that we have to do really at design time. However, we also can do local clock gating or a fine grain type of clock gating. And if we have this type of a situation where our flip-flop has uh, its retaining its state uh, unless some sort of signal tells it to, to change, okay, and that is something that is very common. It happens all over the place in different state machines and in different types of logic. Um, what we can do is instead of having the clock keep on toggling over here on the input pin and wasting power, we can just go and put some sort of an AND gate or something on the clock. And then if uh, this enable signal is not enabled, then we don't um, bring the clock over to this node and we don't waste all the power of the flip-flops. Um, since we can probably share uh, this enable signal between several flip-flops, maybe a bus, you know, 32 flip-flops or something like that, it can reduce a whole bunch of power, okay? But uh, as we saw, the world is not perfect. And if we do that and put a, an, an AND gate over here, we can easily have a glitch which will cause a wrong clock, uh, uh, clock edge to appear here and copy the D into the D out, which may not be correct at that, uh, at that time. We're not allowed to have any glitches on a clock signal. And therefore, we have to use an ICG, an integrated clock gating cell, um, that's the standard cell that implements this thing with a latch and an AND gate and is made to be um, uh, glitch-free as we saw in the lecture. So the answers are that, um, one, clock gating is used to save power. For sure it is. That's the reason we do clock gating. So we don't have these toggles that are unnecessary and therefore we don't uh, waste power. Synthesis tools can automatically insert clock gating. So yes, the synthesis tools go over the structure, find that structure that I showed you, and replace um, the uh, mux over there with the clock gate on, on the clock pin. Uh, note that this is not Boolean equivalent, and therefore it's hard to show logic equivalence, but the tools know how to do that nowadays as well. Okay, most standard cell libraries have special clock gating cells, and again, this is a, another uh, thing that is true. We have these integrated clock gating cells that are provided in the standard cell libraries. So what's not true? Glitch-free clock gating can be implemented with just an AND gate, as we saw there. Um, when we use just an AND gate, we are uh, uh, we are open to glitches, and that's not something that we can tolerate. Okay, question number eight. What is a linter? Another name for a synthesizer, a tool for checking common coding inconsistencies, mistakes, an approach to optimize timing, or a methodology for writing STC commands. So I think it's going to be this one. And guess what? I'm right. So here we talked about it when we were talking about design and verification. We were talking about HDL linting. And um, actually, our synthesizer will probably do some sort of linting inside, but we can also use an external to tool that will be much more elaborate and, and strong for uh, pr doing the linting. So linting tools provide a quick, easy uh, check of likely coding inconsistencies, such as simulation problems, synthesis problems, simulation and synthesis mis mismatches, clock gating, latch inference, clock domain crossing issues, nonsensical assignments, etc., etc. So um, a linter is a real important tool. It's used by uh, in different areas of software, not only in uh, in VLSI, where we actually go and we want to um, have some sort of a tool that has a lot of these different constructs that are not usually allowed. Check our um, our RTL and make sure that we uh, know that we made this thing that maybe you know it may work. But uh, or it may pass compilation and synthesis, but it may not be something that we wanted to do, or it may be methodologically wrong. So that's what a linter does. By the way, the name comes from lint that you have on like your clothes that you find in the in the dryer after you do a, do a load. Um, so uh, that, that's kind of the the junk that you want to get off of your your clothes uh, after they're clean. So that's I guess why they called it a linter. Okay. All of those answers were just uh, made up other than the correct one. Question number nine. What is topographical synthesis? A way to display the design with altitude rings, an algorithm for mapping logic to standard cells according to cell type, a synthesis flow that replaces wire load models with realistic parasitics, or an optimization approach that climbs hills to reach a solution. Okay, so we're talking about topographical synthesis, and um, I think it's this. 
So again, let's go back to where we talked about it. Um, so topographical synthesis, this is what Synopsis calls it. Uh, Cadence calls it something like physical aware synthesis. And there are different tools that change name every once in a while. So if we talked about regular synthesis, what it does is it assumes that the wires have a resistance and a capacitance according to a wire load model, which we'll discuss in a second. But it's a really bad estimation based on things like fan out. Um, what a, uh, a topo topographical or a physical aware synthesizer does, it takes the design and it does some sort of a placement and maybe some sort of an initial route, a uh, quick route, to go and extract what it really thinks the uh, a good estimation of the RC of the lines are. Then it brings it back into the synthesis and goes and runs timing optimizations, um, and now knowing a much more uh, a, a much more uh, accurate version of the timing, and that brings us uh, really much better correlation on our final physical implementation after place and route. Okay, so just going back to the answer, really um, most of these things were just a made up type of a thing. Um, I want to mention that an optimization approach that climbs hills to reach a solution, we'll be discussing that in, uh, in a few lectures. But what uh, topographical synthesis is, it doesn't have anything to do with topography. I'm not sure why it's called that. But it's a synthesis flow that replaces wire load models with realistic parasitics. Okay, so far I've got them all right. Let's see if I can get go for 10 out of 10. To finish, what is the correct order of the synthesis process? So, you got to read these things. But they're just a mix-up of all the different stages that we saw before. And I'm going to guess that it's this one. Luckily, I did get it right. So let's go back to our um, to our um, slides over here. And already at the beginning of this lecture, we saw um, uh, what the flow of the synthesis, synthesis is. So let's see this for summary. We start with syntax analysis. So we read our RTL, and we see that we didn't forget any semicolons and all kinds of other things like that. Once we did that, we can now uh, have our library definition. We read in our libs, okay? If we're doing topographical synthesis, we also need to read in our lefts at this time. And uh, so we have both the libs of the standard cells, and we have the um, libs of, uh, of our other hard macros, our other IPs, okay? Now that we have um, both the RTL and we have the target libraries, um, we can uh, do binding. We couldn't do binding before. We could do elaboration. We could have just taken our syntax, uh, syntax and elaborated and turned it into generic logic gates. But in order to find the uh, leaf cells that are not, you know, not standard logic, we needed to have um, our, our, hard, our hard macros or IPs so we could do binding. So now we have a net list, basically. It's made up of generic cells and our IPs. And we can run pre-mapping optimization, which is doing all these heuristics to, kind of, to try and minimize the the, the literals. Okay, once we finished our pre-mapping optimization, now we actually have like na different names for each of the, the, the inputs, outputs, and specific uh, like um, nets and pins of uh, hard macros. So we can now um, de define our constraints as we'll see in the next lecture. Okay, so once we've done our constraint def definition, we know what our cost function is. We know what we want to optimize. So we take our actual technology, which comes again from the target library over here, and we can map our uh, generics that we had, you know, after our elaboration and after our optimization over here. We can map them to standard cells that have actual delays, actual area and power um, uh, values. Okay, once we finish the initial mapping, we can then run all these different heuristics and try to optimize better towards our constraints, our, um, our cost functions that we defined before. Once we finish that, we'll report and we'll export our net list, uh, our final net list, which is going to be made up now of, uh, of uh, completely of standard cells from the library and our other IPs. So um, that was uh, basically the synthesis flow, read RTL, read libs, elaborate and pre-map opt, read SDC, map, and post map opt. And I'm happy to say that I got everything right this time. Third place was Robin. She didn't do too well, um, and neither did Nancy. Well, no, Nancy did pretty good, but I came out on top. So um, I'm happy that I actually had to answer my own questions. So thanks, and you guys are uh, welcome to ask me questions on YouTube if you have any.